Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Priya Natarajan. I am an astrophysicist and serve as the current director of the Frankie Program in Science and the Humanities at Yale. I am delighted to invite you all to our monthly inference colloquium series. Uh, though first, I would like to recognize our uh, benefactors, Mr. and Mrs. Richard and Barbara Frankie, who are uh, on the call today and have joined us. And I also want to remind all of you that uh, we are recording this event and the recording is made available within a week or so. And since we are recording, uh, we are required to have all participants uh, mute their videos. And um, if you wish uh, to participate in the Q&A, which we uh, encourage, we would like you to submit questions through the chat feature and feel free to submit your questions throughout. Uh, although we will handle the questions and uh, um, the speaker will address them at the end of their talk. So um, I am absolutely delighted today to um, introduce our speaker, um, Professor James Owen Weatherall, who is a professor of logic and philosophy of science at the University of California, Irvine, where he's also a member of the Institute for Mathematical Behavioral Sciences and Center for Cosmology. And um, as you all know, part of the uh, goal for this series is to really try to understand, uh, explore and understand issues related to epistemic models, correlation, causation, and we could not have uh, a better uh, speaker than today's to provide deep insights into what models really do. And over his career, he has looked at a range of questions, very, very interesting, very topical questions. His most recent book is titled The Misinformation Age, How False Beliefs Spread. And uh, which is co-authored with Kaylin O'Corner, in which he sort of explores the social dynamics and the spread, if you will, of belief uh, in evidence-rich environments. And he has several uh, previous books as well, one on The Void, which is the first one of his that I actually read and thoroughly enjoyed that was published in 2016 by Yale University Press. His current research interests, as I mentioned, uh, span a range of very, very relevant issues that have to do with mathematical and conceptual foundations of physics, philosophy of cosmology, and social epistemology. Today, uh, he will be talking to us about polarization of beliefs, in particular on issues where at the gist lie facts in contrast to opinions. So one striking feature, as you have all probably noted, of the current political environment in the United States and elsewhere is that there are large groups of people with extremely divergent beliefs about what are in fact testable matters of fact. So these are matters of fact where there is a rich and widely accessible body of scientific evidence that will clearly support one side over the other. And despite that, there is a raging dispute. And so, you know, we have all seen this manifested in the political environment um, with the elections and the aftermath of the elections, as well as the unfolding global pandemic and all the public health and medical issues that have uh, arisen around that. And we have seen in many ways, the, you know, in the context of the provisional nature of science, we've sort of seen this interplay of the honing and refining of facts and data and evidence and belief formation. We've all sort of had, you know, front row seat to how some of these processes occur, especially in this past year. In his talk today, Jim will draw on recent modeling work to provide three distinct possible explanations for this polarization in belief. And each of these explanations invokes very different mechanisms and recommends different remedies. He will conclude with a discussion of what it means from the perspective of epistemology of a model-based science, that such different models can produce such similar outcomes. And the moral of uh, his talk today will be to caution us against very overly simplistic explanations and understand that these are issues of great complexity and therefore there are no silver bullet solutions to our current quandary, sort of living in an environment which is rampant with misinformation, disinformation, and rampant denial of scientific facts. 
And I just want to mention that as per custom, tomorrow we will host a conversation between uh, Professor Weatherall and Professor Kevin Dorst of the Department of Philosophy from the University of Pittsburgh. And at the same time, so May 26, tomorrow at 3 p.m. And so we are really, really looking forward, uh, Jim, to your talk today. Um, please take it away. And thank you so much to both of you for accepting this invitation. Uh, thank you so much, Priya. Um, and uh, thank you for your work in, in organizing the, the series. Um, I've enjoyed the other talks and I'm glad to get to participate. So I'm gonna uh, share a uh, screen here. Um, great, so I'm uh, just gonna jump right in. Um, uh, I'm gonna talk today about polarization. Um, and so let me just be clear right up front what I mean by polarization, because there are a few different kinds of uh, phenomena that arise in, um, you know, in, in this context that, that sometimes get this name. And so what I have in mind when I talk about polarization today is a situation in which you have a community of um, epistemic agents. So by that, I mean um, a, a community of people who are trying to learn about how the world is. And so um, polarization arises in such a community when the various members of the community come to hold beliefs that diverge from one another. Uh, so I'm, I'm talking about situations where uh, agents come to uh, hold divergent beliefs about matters of fact. And I wanna be very clear when I say belief, I'm not talking about religious belief. I'm not talking about um, assertions about values, what matters, uh, whether something is important or not. Um, what I'm talking about are um, uh, credences about matters of fact. So um, the, the amount of confidence that you have that some assertion about the world is true or false. Now, um, Polarization apparently obtains in real world situations. Um, there are uh, uh, many examples just we've seen in the last several years. For instance, um, you pose the question, was there widespread voter fraud? If widespread is too uh, fuzzy a word. Was there voter fraud at a scale sufficient to influence the outcome of uh, the 2020 US election? Um, considerable amounts of polling data suggest that there really is a divergent there really are divergent beliefs um, in the, the US population about that question um, with a, a great deal of confidence on both sides about what the, the, the facts are. So this is the kind of situation that I have in mind. Um, and uh, um, I'm, I'm focusing here, as, as Priya mentioned in the introduction, on, on cases where it's not just that there are these disagreements, but in fact, there appears to be information available to the community that um, bears on uh, uh, the, uh, the situation in the sense that um, there should be evidence, there's evidence available. Um, prima facie, it appears that that evidence ought to be sufficient to settle the, the issue one way or the other. And yet, nonetheless, it doesn't seem as if uh, uh, consensus um, emerges. Okay, and so what I'm gonna do today is uh, talk about three different models in which polarization is a possible outcome. These are agent-based models in which I um, uh, will describe how um, in sort of very simplified setting, idealized agents um, uh, gather information about the world and share that information, and then uh, update their beliefs in light of that information. Um, and uh, uh, show that in each of these models, um, polarization is a possible outcome. Now, each of these models can be understood to suggest a prima facie plausible explanation of real world polarization. These are the kinds of explanations that you sometimes see theorized um, as the explanation for actual real world polarization. But as I'll discuss, each of the models differs in the kind of explanation that they offer um, and in the, uh, um, the, the details of the conditions under which you should expect polarization to appear. Um, and then, so, you know, most of the talk is going to be discussing these various models and what kinds of explanations of polarization they suggest. 
Um, but I'm going to conclude by uh, thinking about some issues in philosophy of modeling, about what we can infer from this situation, what we can infer from the fact that a single phenomenon, um, a single social phenomenon in this case, can be plausibly modeled in such different ways. I want to acknowledge my uh, collaborator. So I'm going to be discussing three different papers, two of which uh, have appeared in print, one of which is unpublished. Um, Kaylin O'Connor is a uh, co-author on all of these papers, um, also co-author of the book that Priya mentioned, Misinformation Age, where uh, some of these results are, are discussed. OK, so we discussed the, um, the uh, modeling methodology briefly. So I, as I said, I'm going to discuss here agent-based models. Um, I want to emphasize these are highly idealized models. Uh, these are not meant to provide a, uh, a fully accurate, um, uh, complete representation of any kind of human activity. Um, they're supposed to abstract some particular collection of salient features that one might ask whether is it where one might ask whether those features are sufficient under some circumstances to bring about some sort of qualitative uh, phenomenon. Um, and so um, we're, we're reasoning with highly abstract and highly idealized models. Um, I'm going to describe how the models work. So hopefully you'll, you'll get a sense of how this works. But I, I just want to flag up front that we aren't trying to give uh, sort of verisimilitudinous representations of um, the, the actual you know, social world here. We're doing something a little bit different from that. Um, two of the models that I'm going to uh, discuss are within the same uh, modeling framework known as the network epistemology framework. And then the third considers individual Bayesian learning. Now, each project establishes conditions under which polarization may emerge. Now, I absolutely do not want to suggest that these are uh, the only models in which this happens, or the most important models in which this happens, or um, anything like that. Um, they're representative, in a sense, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm describing some of the models that I've worked on. Um, there are many, many other models, some very similar, some very different from the ones I'm going to discuss, that um, uh, lead to very similar sorts of uh, arguments and, and observations. Um, okay, good. So um, I'm gonna begin by giving a sort of an overview of the, the framework in which the first two models uh, lives, um, the network epistemology framework. I'm then going to um, introduce two versions, two network epistemology models that uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm gonna discuss, one based on what I, I'm gonna call trust dynamics, one based on what I'm gonna call conformity. Uh, then I'm going to introduce the, the third model, which uh, works in a somewhat different framework, um, and discuss how that can be used to understand some aspects of journalistic practices. And then I'm going to uh, conclude with a discussion of what we can learn from this modeling situation. So to begin, network epistemology. So to build the models in the first two of uh, these parts of the talk, we work in a framework that was um, originally developed by two uh, economists, uh, Venkatesh Bala and uh, Sanjeev Goyal. Um, they were working with an audience of economists in mind, uh, but their work was adapted to the philosophy of science context uh, about 15 years ago now by Kevin Zolman, who's the, uh, the one on the far left there. And so um, since then, there's been a, a community of people working in philosophy of science using this sort of framework to try to understand various aspects of the social spread of evidence and belief within epistemic communities generally and specifically within scientific communities. And so the way these, these models work is that you have um, a decision problem. So basically, you're trying to, to choose between two possible actions. Um, we're going to call one action A and the other one action B. Now, the setup here is that action A and action B, when they succeed, 
provide the same payoff, but they succeed at different rates. And so you're uncertain about which one has a higher expected value because you're uncertain about which one succeeds at the higher rate. So we're going to assume here that in fact, one of these actions has been well studied and all of the agents are confident that that action is, uh, succeeds at a, a rate of, of 0.5. So half the time it succeeds, it gives payoff one, half the time it fails and it gives no payoff. Um, but they're uncertain about the rate at which the other action, action B, succeeds. And they're trying to learn about whether action B has a higher expected value or a lower expected value um, by testing. That, right, they're, they're performing, the idea is that they perform uh, 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 the various actions. They learn based on what happens when they do perform the actions. They update their beliefs about which action is better. And so there's a whole community trying to converge to um, all act in the way that yields the higher expected value. Now, this is a very simple problem, of course. There are certain kinds of scientific situations that um, have this qualitative feature. So for instance, uh, you might think about a situation where um, a, a new medication is introduced. And if that medication succeeds, uh, it has the outcome that a, a patient is um, survives and if it fails, the, the patient does not survive. You can have two, you know, you're, you're trying to compare now, is this new medication more or less successful than some existing medication whose success rate is well known? Um, one thing that's, that's nice about this particular kind of example is they're pretty high stakes. So you want to perform whatever action you think is the, the better one, um, even though you're, of course, very, very interested in learning uh, from others, whether or not perhaps the other action turns out to be better after all. Okay, and so um, this is the problem that our, our agents are trying to solve. Uh, we represent the agents as having credences. And so these credences can be represented as a single number um, between zero and one. We can think of that as the probability that the agent, each agent, assigns to the proposition that B is better. Now, I, I should um, say in all of these models, we're just adopting the convention that in fact, B is better. Um, this is important because there really is a better outcome. Um, you know, there, there, there's a, a fact of the matter. There's some, some truth here that we can know about outside the model and which we can observe now how the agents uh, learn, how successfully they are at learning about um, uh, whether or not B is in fact better. Okay, and so um, the agents uh, uh, are arranged on a network. So the idea is that each agent in each round of, the, of a simulation is understood to perform an action. They perform the action that they think is better some number of times. Um, and so if they're the, the number that represents their credence is greater than 0.5, they perform action B. If it's less than 0.5, they perform action A some number of times. After doing that, you can think of this as a kind of um, performing an experiment. You, you get some sample um, and could be one, but it could be greater than one. So you, you could perform the action several times. Think of that as the results of an experiment. And now um, you, you take that data and uh, each agent updates their belief in light of that data um, using Bayes' rule. Okay. Um, now, in addition to updating based on their own data, this is where the network structure comes in, right? This is why this is network epistemology. In addition to updating uh, um, their beliefs based on their own data, all of the agents also update their beliefs based on the data generated by their immediate neighbors. And so what happens here is that you have, uh, at least to begin with, uh, different agents in the network performing the two different actions. But then in general, uh, all or, or, or many of the agents receiving information not only about what they think is the better action, but also what their neighbors think is the better action. And this way they can update on, on both kinds of actions. And eventually they converge to um, uh, some sort of outcome. Okay, now um, this basic model as I've just described it, is one in which generally authors have found that 
uh, communities converge towards consensus. That is, either all of the agents converge to having very high confidence that action B is in fact better, an outcome that we'll call true consensus, so um, uh, consensus about the truth. And the other possibility is that the agents all erroneously settle on the worst action, A. Now, but because of the structure of this model, um, you're, you're gonna get one or the other. So basically what's going to happen is eventually all of the agents are gonna be performing action B, which is in fact better. And overall the data is going to, to tend to keep their beliefs that B is better high. Um, or what's going to happen is that all of them are going to come to believe that A is better and no one will perform action B anymore. And so you end up with a stable outcome where no new information about action B is gathered because everyone has decided that the, the worse action is uh, better. Okay, so that, that's the, the, the basic model that we're gonna be working with the first two parts of this talk here. Um, now I'm going to discuss the first of two sort of modifications to this model that introduce some component that uh, might be understood to explain polarization. Okay, so this is based on a paper that Caitlin and I wrote um, that was published in the European Journal for Philosophy of Science uh, a few years ago called Scientific Polarization. So in this model, what we do is we begin with the same network epistemology model that uh, I discussed, but we modify how agents update in light of evidence produced by other agents. So agents still update in light of their own evidence in the same way, but they um, update in light of uh, other agents' evidence in a different way. The idea here, the, the motivation for this, um, is that uh, we suppose that agents take some evidence to be of higher quality than others. Um, and uh, the higher quality evidence they're going to, to take, to, they're going to be very confident in. Lower quality evidence they're going to be less confident in. So how do they determine what kind of evidence to be confident in? Um, well, of course, there are various ways in which you can imagine sort of very complicated, high rationality sorts of strategies for figuring this out. Um, here we suppose just a very simple one, which is that um, the agents take the data generated by people who disagree with them to be less trustworthy. Now, why would you do that? Uh, so one idea here is that um, in, if you're evaluating someone's information, the information that someone is sharing with you, and you think, okay, this is an epistemic process. Um, they, they've somehow uh, gathered this data. I'd like to try to evaluate how good they are as epistemic agents. How, how likely are they to come to, to good conclusions, collect data reliably and so on. Um, and I'm gonna use their past epistemic success by my own lights to evaluate that. And so the idea is that if I look around and I see, well, these people, uh, according to the data that I have access to and, and the beliefs that I hold, appear to have succeeded in their epistemic tasks, I'm gonna assume that the data they're sharing with me is more reliable. And the people who, by my own lights, appear to have failed at their epistemic tasks, I'm gonna understand to um, likely be producing data that's less reliable. Now, I'm still gonna treat that data in general as something I could update on, but I'm going to um, treat it as less certain. And so here's the idea. Um, I am going to um, model trust here as a, um, an assignment of uncertainty to the amount, uh, sorry, an assignment of uncertainty to the data produced by other agents, where the amount of uncertainty is described by some function that decreases with the distance between my beliefs and the agent who's produced the data's beliefs. And so the idea here is that an agent who, um, if, if, I, if someone produces evidence that is, um, I'm sorry, if someone holds beliefs that are very distant from mine, whatever evidence they produce, I'm gonna treat that as 
uh, more uncertain than uh, evidence produced by someone who is closer to my own beliefs. Now, um, the updating rule that we use here, I, I didn't write it down on the slide, but it, it's a, a standard updating rule, an alternative to Bayes' rule for um, updating beliefs in light of evidence known as uh, Jeffrey conditionalization, which is the standard way of updating beliefs in light of uncertain evidence. And so what's going on here is we're treating uh, evidence produced by others as uncertain evidence with some degree of uncertainty that's determined by this function. Now, I'll just note that this kind of strategy, um, so using Jeffrey conditionalization uh, uh, to model this, um, uh, I believe is original to this paper, but the, the basic kind of strategy where you conditionalize how you, uh, how agents update their beliefs or their opinions um, based on some function of the distance between their beliefs or opinions uh, is widespread in the literature. Um, this is something that's been, been studied at least since the early 2000s. Um, and, uh, and so what we're doing is adapting this kind of, um, this kind of mechanism uh, to the network epistemology framework and introducing the idea that Jeffrey conditionalization is a, um, a, a useful way of, of, of modeling it. Now, I'll just note that we have to introduce some decreasing function uh, of the distance between agents' beliefs to do this. We consider several different ones, just a linear function, exponential, um, uh, and some others. <clears throat> and the qualitative results don't, don't depend on that. Um, as long as it's a strictly decreasing function, um, we get uh, um, uh, qualitatively the same results. And the qualitative results are really what we, um, we take to be trustworthy here or in any way. Um, uh, the relevant output of the model. Okay, so what are the results of this? Well, first, there's a new possibility now. And the new possibility is that um, for certain values of this parameter M, which governs uh, how strongly uh, uh, agents tend to distrust other agents, um, we can begin to see polarization. So when that parameter exceeds a certain value, conventionally set to one uh, in the model as we've set it up, we see polarization, which are stable outcomes where some agents have high credence that B is better and some have low credence that B is better, i.e. they believe that A is better. And moreover, it's stable because the agents don't trust one another. They've, they've come to occupy, to, to um, be distant enough from one another in belief space that the agents that are performing action B and um, producing evidence that the better action is in fact better, uh, no longer influence the agents who uh, believe that, agent, that uh, action A is better, right? And so what happens is, uh, although lots of evidence is being produced and lots of evidence is being shared, You've gotten to a situation where uh, the agents are so distant from one another that they don't trust one another and they don't update in light of the evidence that's shared by the other group. And um, one way of thinking about what happens here is as M becomes larger and larger, the, um, the, the distance in belief but that needs to be achieved in order for this um, or failure of listening to occur, get smaller and smaller. And so the idea is that, you know, there's, there, there's some parameter here that's going to govern how that works. Um, and so here's a chart that shows how, how that happens in the model. Um, as I said before, M equals one is conventionally set as the, the value of the parameter for which uh, it's even possible for them to stop listening to one another, as opposed to merely treating each other's evidence as uh, very uncertain, but still updating on it. Um, and so as you see, as M gets larger, various sizes of networks, what we see is that polarization becomes increasingly likely. Um, and uh, once M gets up to two or a little bit higher, uh, you begin to see polarization in all or nearly all runs. Um, okay. 
could um, just note that it's not just that that um, sort of this parameter M doesn't just increase polarization. It, it also increases the, uh, the, the total number of false beliefs that are held by the community. And so what you see here are plots of uh, average outcomes across a large range of different parameter values, different values of N, different values of the number of agents in the network, um, uh, and so on, different values of epsilon, how hard a problem it is, how, how big is the difference in expectation value between action A and action B. And what you see is across all of those different parameters, as M increases, the fraction of the network that ends up holding false beliefs increases. Um, and so uh, you're going to see different fractions depending on the different other parameters, but each of these lines is uh, higher than the one before it. OK, so <clears throat> there's lots more that I could say about this model, but the point is to describe several models. So let me uh, move on and just point to some of the takeaways from this model that are going to be important in the discussion that follows. So I think the first takeaway is just that polarization can apparently occur under these sorts of circumstances. That is, it can occur in an epistemic community um, with certain kinds of properties in which agents tend to distrust evidence produced by some agents, where um, that distrust is conditioned on their difference in belief. Um, now, in the present model, uh, the, the phenomenon is driven by the fact that agents explore, i.e. perform the action that they think is better. And so it's the people who believe B is better who are performing action B, who are generating data about action B. And it's precisely those agents that uh, are ignored by or distrusted by the ones who hold the false belief, the ones who think that action A is better. Um, and so what's happening here is that uh, distrust is preventing the reliable information from reaching the people who would need it to um, reach more reliable uh, uh, beliefs. And so you might think of this as, as possibly a way of modeling certain kinds of um, certain kinds of uh, vaccine hesitancy where um, uh, some people are believe that the va vaccines, you know, say a COVID vaccine is safe and effective. Other people think um, it hasn't been shown to be safe or it hasn't been shown to be effective. Um, there's a lot of data now, population level data, uh, hundreds of millions of people across the world who have received this vaccine, good data on what their outcomes have been so far. Um, but if that data isn't trusted by the people who are skeptical for various reasons. Maybe they think it's manipulated. Maybe they think that um, people are trying to mislead them or have some ulterior motive. They're not going to update their beliefs in light of that data, even though it's present. So um, I just want to say once again, uh, this is a particular model, but in fact, this is consonant with a very large literature discussing, um, especially what's sometimes known as opinion dynamics. Uh, in the case where um, agents condition how their beliefs change on the distance between their belief or their opinion and uh, that of other agents. And so this is a widely studied phenomenon. It's one common possible explanation that you see in uh, um, the mathematical social sciences literature for how polarization might arise. Okay, <clears throat> now we're gonna switch gears. We're gonna talk about another network epistemology model, one that invokes a different mechanism to explain polarization, um, which I'm gonna call conformity. Once again, this is uh, based on a paper that uh, Kalen and I wrote together. Uh, Kalen doesn't like this paper as much, so she let me be first author on this one. <clears throat> okay, so conformity. So th there's a very long literature in social psychology that um, experimental literature that, that documents a tendency of, of human subjects to conform with members of their social group. Um, the ASH experiments in particular is one where uh, you have a, a subject um, uh, in a group where the other groups are, are, are not experimental subjects, but are um, 
uh, members of the research team. And what happens is the, um, the whole group are, are shown a number of pictures, right? So you, you have a line and then two other lines with, um, uh, or two or three other lines. Anyway, you're shown a line, you're shown some other lines, and you're asked, is, is this first line uh, the same length as one of these other ones? And um, the various uh, research group participants, I mean, the, the ones who are, are not subjects, uh, say that um, something that's obviously false, that you know, this line, which is clearly this, the, the same length as this other line is longer. Uh, and then the, the research subject is uh, asked to, uh, to, to give their um, opinion on this. And you find that in a significant number of uh, cases, they will go along with the group, despite the, uh, the fact that just the evidence of their senses, right? The, the fact that it's obviously the case um, that uh, uh, the group has, um, you know, the other members of the group have, have uh, expressed some false view. Um, okay, so uh, given that tendency, we might try to introduce conformity into a network epistemology framework uh, as follows. So the idea here is that when you're making a decision about what action to perform, um, you might be thinking about the payoff you'll get from performing that action. But you might also be considering some other preferences that will enter into an expected value calculation. And so um, one such preference might be a desire to conform your actions to the actions of your neighbors. So um, we model this by adding a conformity parameter, um, which tracks how much payoff actors get simply from matching their behaviors to those of their network neighbors. Now, um, we once again a, a adopt a, a very uh, low rationality model here. We aren't, um, you know, each agent isn't trying to model the beliefs or likely actions of the other agents around them. All they're doing is they're saying, well, what did people do in the last round? Um, if uh, um, most people did action A, then I'm going to uh, expect to get a, a payoff from conforming to action A. Um, and what I, in, in order to choose to do action B, I need to not only believe that action B is better, but I also need it to be the case that um, the benefits that I, I get by, um, you know, the, the good feeling I get by conforming to all of my neighbors doing action A uh, has to overcome the benefits of performing action B. Okay, and so, the idea here is that we're going to weigh two different desires, a desire to choose accurate actions and get the payoffs that come with that, and a desire to conform with neighbors. Now, when we introduce this, um, we once again, like with uh, the trust dynamics, um, begin to see new possible outcomes for the model. So simulations can still approach either true consensus or false consensus. Those are still possible outcomes. but um, Another possible outcome that doesn't exist in the base model is a situation where uh, the network may con converge to a situation where everyone performs the same action, even though some agents secretly believe that the other action is better. But they don't perform the other action um, because they prefer to, convert, uh, to, to conform. And because they don't perform the other action, no new evidence regarding the superiority of the other action uh, is introduced into the network. And so although um, there are, uh, there's some diversity of belief here, it's not reflected in the data that's generated and shared in the network. Um, and uh, uh, we, we call that situation, um, we have two different names. One is true disagreement and false disagreement. So true disagreement is a situation where everyone's performing the better action, but there's disagreement still. The other situation is where um, everyone's performing the worse action, they're performing action A, even though some people um, believe that action B is better. Now, finally, we can uh, find an outcome where you get polarization in action and belief. So the idea here is that, um, under some circumstances, specifically in the presence of certain network structures, what can happen is that one group um, comes to believe that 
action A is better and they all perform action A. And another group comes to believe that action B is better and they all perform action B. But the uh, information doesn't pass effectively between the groups. So to see how this depends on network structure, let me introduce a few um, basic network structures. So um, consider lots of different things. Um, the cycle, the wheel, the com complete network, these are standard networks to consider. We're not going, uh, they're not that important for our purposes. The ones that are important for our purposes are what happens when you have a randomly generated network using various different kinds of algorithms for generating networks. Um, or in particular, you look at networks that you might describe as clumpy or having clicks. So the idea here is that uh, polarization is going to appear specifically in cases where networks have a click structure. So how does this work? Well, the idea is if you have a, a click here is defined as a group of agents that are tightly connected to one another, but only weakly connected to other groups of agents who are in turn mutually tightly connected to one another. As we see in this case, we have two separate complete networks that are linked only by a single edge. And so the way in which polarization can appear here is that in one of these clicks, uh, everyone comes to believe action B is better. They perform action B um, and they, they, that sort of mini network uh, uh, approaches a true consensus. Whereas in the other click, everyone comes to perform action A and almost all of them believe that action A is better. But in fact, the one agent in this picture who uh, has access to the information from the other click will generally over time come to update on that information, come to believe that in fact action B is better. But because of their preference to conform, and there's only one action B doer in their immediate network, but there are many action A doers in their immediate network, they never switch their action. But because they're a kind of bridge for this information, because they never switch their action, the other agents in their click never receive data showing that action B is better. So the picture is one where that, that agent uh, conforming um, sort of blocks the spread of reliable information into their click. Okay. And so you can see uh, different kinds of outcomes here, depending on how strong this conformity parameter is. Basically, the conformity parameter is just a measure of how, how strong the preference is for um, conforming your action to those of your neighbors. What you see is that, um, you know, as conformity increases, correct consensus still tends to be uh, more likely. Um, correct disagreement is the, the next most likely outcome. And then you start seeing these uh, incorrect consensus and incorrect disagreements. But then you have this very you know, small likelihood here of getting polarization. But that, you know, how big that likelihood is depends on just what your network structure is. And so if we look at specifically different network structures, we see different results. And so, um, especially in the case of high conformity, which is the, uh, the plot on the, um, the left here, unless I'm mirrored, in which case it's the plot on the right, um, the one that's labeled high conformity, what you see is that in the clumpy case, right, this case with the strong click structure, uh, nearly half of all outcomes are polarized outcomes. Um, and so uh, if you have a network that has that structure, then you can expect polarization to occur simply due to conformity without needing any other explanation. Okay. So what can we take away from this? Well, in the presence of certain network structure, conformity provides another sufficient cause for polarization. And that's because of this, this mechanism whereby you get bottlenecks, as I described. Now, if you're thinking, well, I mean, how realistic are these sorts of uh, clumpy networks? Well, the answer is that, in fact, um, uh, research, empirical research on um, all sorts of real human social networks, from the structure of uh, Facebook networks to studies of sort of ordinary um, offline populations, suggests that real social networks have a characteristic known as uh, a small world property, which means that 
um, uh, agents tend to uh, have few connections, but to have a very short path length between them and anyone else. This is sometimes called the Kevin Bacon effect, where um, uh, Jim is are, this. Uh, Jim, are these also referred to as bubbles, or is that uh, slightly different? So that's that's slightly different. This 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 predates the idea of uh, you know, filter bubbles um, oh, okay. by uh, a, a few decades. Yeah, so this is just a, a general result in, in network theory that you can describe small world networks and then it turns out to be an empirical fact that you have these sorts of small world networks in, in real um, real situations where, and they're called small worlds because, so the, the, the small world metaphor isn't supposed to be one where you think we have these, these isolated worlds that are distinct from one another, like little, worlds, rather it's the small world phenomenon, like who would have known that you knew so-and-so um, or that you were just two or three connections away from so-and-so. Now, I don't remember the number exactly, but it's something like uh, on average, the average path length between random Facebook um, uh, um, members is uh, very, very low. It's like four or five. Um, and so you know, the, the average path length for information to spread to anywhere in the network. Uh, is, is surprisingly short. Um, but the point is that these small world networks are ones that have clicks. Um, and if you, um, th there's a, a, a standard algorithm for generating small world networks, generating random small world networks, known as the Strogatz Watts algorithm. If you use that algorithm to generate your networks, you use net random networks with this conformity dynamics, you find polarization at a um, much higher rate than in the uh, other sort of more uniform networks that uh, I introduced. Um, okay, so this is another kind of possible explanation for polarization having to do with uh, the network structure of human interaction. Let me now introduce uh, yet another model with a totally different framework and mechanism. Now, this last paper is a work in progress. Um, it's collaborative with Kalen, but also with uh, um, one of our graduate students, uh, Aidan Mosin. Okay, so <clears throat> the last two models considered uh, social factors um, as uh, you know, so ways in which people um, uh, update on evidence from other agents and um, uh, change their behavior in light of the behavior of other agents uh, to explain how polarization can appear. Um, in this model, we're going to, to look just at individuals who are um, engaged in a kind of a, a Bayesian learning uh, activity um, based on a, a stream of data generated by some outside source. And we're gonna understand this, this data generated by the outside source to represent information that they receive from some media. So, you can think about this as applying to different kinds of cases. You can think about it as applying to uh, um, you know, traditional news media, or you could think about it as applying to social media. But the idea is that there's some, um, some process by which the data that they see is generated by some intermediary. The, the data that they see is somehow curated by some, uh, some, something between them and the world. Um, and the idea is that, that there's a curation process that involves some practices, right? So some process is involved in choosing what data of all the data that's, that's sort of generated in the world um, agents actually update on. What we're going to ask is how those practices interact with individual reasoning biases to influence belief. So <clears throat> here's the basic picture. News media do not report on all events in the domain. Some events are selected for coverage. So how do you choose which events to cover? Now, if you look at actual practice, you look at um, norms for how journalists should practice, you see various criteria um, described that um, uh, are applied to select which of the events are going to be reported on, right? And so just as an example, it's a you know, classic adage of uh, journalism, you don't report on dog bites man, you report on man bites dog, right? So you report on the things that are unusual or unexpected or perhaps extreme events, right? The biggest hurricane, you know, the worst hurricane season, the, you, know, you don't report on every earthquake, you report on the ones that are above a certain uh, 
uh, threshold on the Richter scale. Um, another example of a, a criterion that might be applied. The longstanding norm in uh, journalism, which in the US was actually um, part of a official FCC policy until the 1980s, that um, enjoins journalists, previously required journalists, uh, to report fairly. Now, this idea of, of fair reporting was given a, a particular um, characterization. The idea was that if you ever reported on some controversial matter, you would need either within your story or elsewhere within um, your organization to also give equal time to other sides of that issue. And so even to this day, um, USA Today, for instance, if they run a, uh, uh, an editorial on a controversial topic, they always pair it with an editorial supporting the opposite position. But you also see within just regular articles um, an expectation that the other side will be described and will be given some, um, uh, some space to express their views. Okay, so these are two different examples of, of what I mean by criteria that may be applied to select which events are reported. So how are we going to model this? Well, here's the idea. The idea is that um, there's some range of events that occur in the world. Think of it maybe as um, storms. And the storms are sampled from some normal distribution W. Right? And so you can think of this, the severity of the storm as just being some um, something that, that is randomly generated, um, sampled from some random variable, distributed according to this normal distribution, W, with fixed mean and fixed standard deviation. Now, journalists aren't going to cover every storm that happens. What they're going to do is they're going to select from this initial distribution which events to cover. And you can think of this as a process by which the distribution W is transformed into another distribution, which you can call a reported distribution, R, which generally differs from W. Okay, and so now we have some agents who are interested in learning about how the world is, but they're getting their information from journalists. And so what they're doing is they're updating their beliefs on data that's randomly sampled from this new distribution, R, the distribution of reported events. And what we're interested in is how does their posterior distribution, how, how does the, the Bayesian agent's beliefs about the world differ from the distribution of actual events? In, in particular, we're going to assume that the underlying process, we, we can take the agents to assume that the underlying process is Gaussian with unknown mean and variance. They're going to assume interchangeability. And what we're going to do is norm, uh, uh, model their beliefs with what's known as a normal inverse gamma distribution. Now, the important thing here is just um, that distribution allows them to calculate an expected value for the mean of W and an expected value for the standard deviation or the variance of W. Um, and what's going to happen is we're going to be able to compare those expected values for the mean and the variance with the actual mean and variance of W. Okay, and so we're going to assume that W is some normal distribution. It's got some fixed mean and variance. Um, the mean mu in general can uh, be off zero. And so we're going to assume that there's some social neutral point, sort of what, you know, um, uh, uh, what people take, um, you know, what journalists, I should say, take to be the uh, um, you know, sort of common knowledge about, you know, where things are on average. But the actual distribution is going to be um, and, and you know, maybe uh, deviate from that. Um, and now we're going to consider a few different processes by which the reported distribution R is constructed. So one, hyperbole. Journalists just exaggerate. So um, sometimes, you know, so what happens is, you know, X occurs, they report some factor H times X. You know, it's the biggest storm, the worst hurricane, the biggest uh, earthquake, even if it isn't really the biggest. Um, Okay, and so we have, have some parameter H that governs how that works. Here's another process, um, extremity. Journalists only report on events that lie some distance from the, the neutral point. And so um, this is again, like, I'm not gonna report on every earthquake. I'm only gonna report on the ones that exceed some value 
uh, on the Richter scale. Um, and then the final one is fair reporting, which I discussed before. And the way that we're gonna model that here is that every time you have an event that journalists wanna report on on one side of the neutral point, they need to look for another event that represents the other side. So every time they report on uh, one side, they report on the other side as well. Now they're always reporting real events. They're just um, pairing them in a way where um, every event on one side corresponds to an event on the other. Now we're also, we also consider distributions that result from combining these. We look at each of these individually, we combine them in various ways. Um, now, just to give you a sense of, of what this does, um, each of these uh, um, transformations can be understood to produce a distribution. Um, and so if we start with our distribution W, uh, labeled here as the objective distribution, what hyperbole does is sort of flatten that distribution, but also shift its mean a little bit away from the, uh, um, the neutral point, zero. Um, what extremity bias does is it just cuts out part of the events. So not all of the events are reported, just the, the tails. Um, and then fair reporting uh, does this thing where um, you basically take the part of the distribution uh, on each side of the uh, neutral point and you normalize it so that the probability of being on one side or on the other is 0.5, right? That, that corresponds to pairing these events. Um, uh, but you do it in such a way that um, you're only, you're, you're keeping the shape of the distribution the same. You're just rescaling so that the total uh, area underneath the distribution to the left of zero is equal to that to the right of zero. Okay, so what sorts of results do we see here? Well, an agent updating on data sampled from R converges to a posterior distribution that approximates R, right? So we're just approximating each of these distributions as a normal distribution. In general, these are gonna differ from the true distribution. Um, you can you know, error with respect to the mean or the variance, but um, you're gonna be able to see these as a pretty um, straightforward approximation of the reported uh, evidence. So what you see then is that, well, the way you get the most reliable beliefs is just by reporting on the true distribution of evidence. So here, here's just an example of this I'm sort of uh, cognizant of time here. I'm timing myself. I've been going for 52 minutes, but uh, I started a little bit late and I know that it's one now. So I'm going to uh, pick up the pace a little bit here. Um, <clears throat> so uh, here's an example of this. Um, you have some true distribution of evidence. You then have a reported distribution of events combining some of these different uh, distortions. And then you end up with some posterior, uh, this is the one on the, uh, the, the, the pink one here, um, some posterior distribution that approximates with a normal distribution, the reported evidence. <clears throat> okay, so now let's consider the following addition to this model. We suppose that instead of updating on all of the, the data that journalists produce, um, agents uh, have a cognitive bias. There's, they have a, a tendency to um, prefer to update on data that is consistent with their existing beliefs. So this is known as confirmation bias, um, where individuals seek out evidence that supports their existing beliefs and they ignore evidence that conflicts with them. Or alternatively, sometimes they reinterpret evidence that conflicts with their beliefs um, as uh, supporting their beliefs when, they, when it doesn't. So here's how we're gonna implement this idea. We're gonna suppose that there's some probability for any reported event that the agent uh, updates on that event. Um, but that probability is going to be less than one and it's going to be a decreasing function of the distance between data and the agent's expectation for the mean result. So one way of thinking about this is um, the probability of updating on data that uh, the agent thinks is very likely is going to be higher than the probability of updating on data that the agent thinks is very unlikely. 
So what happens when we introduce this modification? Well, it turns out that when with this uh, uh, modification, once again, based on very well-documented psychological behavior in real people, we get a very different kind of outcome. Now what happens is instead of uh, trying to approximate the uh, whole distribution of reported events with a Gaussian, what we find is that agents tend to con converge to a Gaussian centered at or near one of the modes of the reported distribution, in particular, whichever mode is closest to their prior expected mean. So what this means is that for bimodal reported distributions, which can occur when you have um, extremity bias or when you have fair and balanced reporting, um, you can come up with situations, you find situations where uh, agents that have priors on one side converge to the mode closest to them, whereas agents that have beliefs on the other side converge to the node that's closest to them. And these are gonna generally be different from one another. And in fact, what you can see is that over time, beliefs can actually diverge from one another. Priors that are close to one another can uh, uh, become more distant with more data. Um, and the reason that happens is even though the, mo the, the, the priors are initially close to one another, nonetheless, one is closer to one mode and the other closer to the other mode, and they approach the modes of the reported distribution. So here's a figure that shows that happening. You have some true distribution of evidence. You have here some combination of extremity bias and uh, um, fair reporting that leads to some uh, distorted um, reported distribution of evidence. And what you find is in these, these two different uh, charts on the right, the two pink ones, um, Agents that um, begin with slightly different priors, right? You see that that in both cases, their their uh, their priors are um, you know they're less certain, and they end up being the priors the the um, more the less opaque um, Gaussian. What you see is that although they start kind of close to one another, over time they separate, and moreover, their confidence becomes uh, much greater. I.e., their expected value for the standard deviation of the events in the world becomes um, smaller. Um, and so neither agent ends up uh, approximating the true distribution of events very well. Um, they both have smaller variance in the true distribution of events and they get the mean wrong. Okay, so this is the kind of polarization, right? It's a polarization where uh, agents with different priors um, presented with the same evidence, end up with different posteriors. Um, and what's driving this result is the way that we've modeled confirmation bias, along with the way in which the uh, evidence is presented. Um, and what happens is, in cases where there's little or no data that lies between the two modes, agents don't get pulled towards the true central behavior. Right? So they never end up approximating W, because all they ever see or all they ever actually update on is um, data that lies uh, near one of the two modes. Now, I think, you know, it's not really the point of the talk today. I just want to flag, though, one very interesting result of this work is that hyperbole, which I think is, is arguably the only of these biases that we really consider um, problematic, uh, generally speaking, or at least incompatible with good journalistic practice. Um, actually doesn't contribute to polarization unless you also have fairness and extremity bias. Um, and uh, extremity bias, especially to a lesser extent now, fairness um, do conform with journalistic norms. Um, I, I think that it's, it's not considered problematic for journalists to report only on uh, things that are considered interesting or novel or um, uh, out of the ordinary. Okay, so... <clears throat> Again, in the interest of time, I'm going to do this briefly, but I'm going to ask now, what do these models taken together tell us about the real world phenomenon of polarization? You know, which model is right? Now, I think that there's a, a, a tempting line of thought here. Just to think about this sort of situation in a way analogous to how you might think about a scientific theory. So the idea here is you come up with some model, 
that model reproduces some qualitative phenomenon. You might take that fact as prima facie evidence that some feature of the model actually describes how, you know, some aspect of how, um, say, a, a social situation or social group functions. Right? This is a move that's very similar to a standard inferential pattern often attributed to scientists, whereby if you have a theory that makes some prediction, say about the outcomes of some experiment or the tendency of some phenomenon to occur, and then you find that that phenomenon occurs, you infer that the theory must be true or approximately true, or you increase your credence that that particular theory is accurate. Um, now, there's a well-known defeater for this sort of reasoning, which is a situation in which you have what's sometimes called underdetermination of theory by evidence. That is, you have um, many different theories that are apparently equally compatible with the observed data. So in a case like that, if you have different theories that explain the data and you don't have a way of choosing between them, you might say, well, that means that undermines my, my confidence in any of them. And so you might think that the right moral to draw from models of the sort that I've just discussed is that, look, these models can't tell us anything about how real world polarization works. We can't infer anything from them. They disagree about the underlying mechanism. They provide different explanations. Um, and uh, uh, that means that we can't choose between them. And if we can't choose between them, that means that we can't, for instance, um, use them to make any kinds of policy recommendations. We can't use them to um, think about, you know, uh, how we got into a particular epistemic situation, how we might get out of it. Um, we can't use them to, to reason effectively about the world as we find it. And so you might think then this, that, that really what we need to understand real world polarization is something, something very different. So maybe some combination of fine grained empirical evidence, something that can, can really um, distinguish these cases from one another, help us understand what's really going on. Um, now, maybe there's still a role for models of this sort, or perhaps actually successor models that um, are, um, you know, attempt to model the world with greater um, detailed accuracy. Um, because then you might think, well, what the models can do is come up with more specific and discriminating predictions that we could then use to uh, distinguish between the possible explanations of polarization presented um, by each of these models. <clears throat> now, I want to suggest that that is not at all the right moral to draw from this situation. But in fact, we can draw much stronger um, and more important morals from uh, the, uh, the models as presented. And why is that? Well, the kind of dialectic I just presented seems to take for granted that if these models disagree about the underlying cause of polarization, then they are incompatible, right? And this is the sort of thing you might think to be true if uh, you're talking about say theories in physics where um, different theories, you know, if you have two different theories of the electron, you might think only one of them can be right and so if both of them reproduce the data you have, you don't have a way of choosing between them, even though you know only one of them could be correct. Um, but that's not what's going on here. It's not the case that these different mechanisms are incompatible. Um, rather, I think what we see here is that there are apparently multiple sufficient causes for the social phenomenon of polarization. Now, I, as I said at the beginning, I don't at all mean to suggest that what I've given here is an exhaustive list or even the most important examples of um, possible causes of polarization. I just claim that these are models that suggest that a certain kind of mechanism may be sufficient for polarization. But all of these mechanisms can be present together. Right? It can be that we have confirmation bias. In fact, it appears we do have confirmation bias. And it may be that we have conformity bias. And in fact, it appears we do have conformity bias. Um, and it may be that we tend to trust some sources of evidence more than others, and perhaps we condition based on um, the uh, epistemic success of the, uh, uh, the originator of the evidence, which apparently is something that we do do. So all of these can be operative at the same time. Now, what that means is that even if you had more fine-grained empirical data um, and uh, predictions that tried to distinguish between the different models, 
the fact that you could get good evidence that one of these mechanisms is present and is leading to polarization does not imply that the other ones are not also present and also contributing to polarization. So in fact, I think that the right way of thinking about what's going on here is that we see that evidence for a particular hypothesis here about what causes polarization isn't evidence against other alternative, you might have thought competing, but in fact, complementary explanations of polarization. And so um, I take that to uh, um, be the, the basis for a strong cautionary note about how to think about policymaking um, intended to um, uh, somehow ameliorate polarization, particularly say polarization in social media. The idea is that um, policy interventions tend to focus on unitary explanations of a phenomenon. There's some positive cause, some idea that if you intervene on that cause through policymaking, say changing the way that algorithms can work on Facebook, changing the way that, <clears throat> that um, Twitter works, number of Twitter followers someone can have, whatever, um, that by intervening on that particular variable, you're going to have some uh, clear um, impact, influence on uh, the, the, the thing that you're trying to, to change, in this case, polarization. But if it's true that there are multiple mutually compatible, independently sufficient possible causes for polarization, and it's not clear that any single explanation is going to suffice. And that means that policy interventions that target a single cause are not only um, unlikely to succeed on their own, but may even backfire because what you need to be attentive to is the way in which um, by trying to block one mechanism, which is actually present, you can unwittingly amplify another mechanism, which is also present. Just as an example, suppose you're the sort of person that thinks that conformity and um, disc, you know, poor connections between different networks of people. This is, Priya mentioned the filter bubble idea, but that's basically what's going on. Um, on this sort of proposal, the idea would be, well, what's going on is that you have, um, you know, people sometimes say a red internet and a blue internet. Republicans see some things when they go online. Uh, Democrats see other things when they go online. They're updating on different stuff. Um, they're conforming with different groups. And it's by uh, sort of separating uh, those that you end up with polarization. And so if we increased the connections, right, showed more Democrats more Republican media and showed more Republicans, more Democratic media, you might think what's gonna happen is you're gonna have some convergence. Well, it could be that conformity and these network effects are playing a role, but nonetheless trust dynamics is also playing a role. In which case by exposing, more, exposing people more to the other side, if they distrust the other side enough, it's either not gonna make any difference or may under some circumstances even make people tend to um, polarize more, um, for instance, uh, using something like, uh, um, well, uh, under some, some modifications of the trust dynamics can actually lead them to uh, polarize more. And so what this means, practically speaking, is that empirical work cannot be directed only to positively identifying uh, specific causal factors, right? Not only to showing that some factor is operative in some context, but also to establishing what other factors are also operative and to weighing the relative causal contribution of the possibly many different causal factors. Now, this is a, a much more difficult kind of activity and something that um, I think is very, it, it, you know, we don't have great methods to my knowledge of, of establishing this kind of relative uh, uh, amount of significance. But it seems to me that in a situation like this, where we have multiple sufficient causes for a social phenomenon, um, and some reason to think that all of them may be present and may be important, um, this is what we need to figure out how to do in order to be able to properly evaluate any kind of policy proposal that's um, gonna be successfully sensitive to the, uh, the full complexity of the situation. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Jim. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, 
And so I would like to uh, <laughs> invite everyone to unmute and clap, yes. Um, yeah, much to think about. So if I may, before opening up the floor to questions, uh, ask you one myself. Um, I was just, I mean, I, um, I really like your caution showing that there are many ways to think about it, but that we need to really be cautious about concluding that there's one simple solution or that we have captured the under, you know, the actual real world polarization adequately uh, with any of these models uh, to really chase after one solution or the other. I think I wanted to come back to this issue that, that you did raise in the beginning and bring in the work of Dan Kahan, who is at the Center for Cultural Cognition at Yale, where you know the, he's been studying, as you know, the sort of disbelief in climate change and science denialism. So it sounds like you know this this landscape of priors that people have that you know these are informed by very but are tr by our tribal identities, and they are part and parcel of a larger worldview. So one of the things he his findings often show that. You know, there are sort of these two broadish mindsets, sort of a more collectivist mindset and a more individualist mindset. And that this mindset is independent of one's position on any one particular issue. That is a broad lens with which people see the whole world. And therefore then every issue gets refracted through that lens. So I was very curious, um, you know, in these modeling approaches, you obviously had room for priors and stuff, but I was curious what can, if anything, be done about what seems like a fundamental psychological, uh, sociological schism between personality types that is, you know, very historically, culturally, politically rooted. Um, and, you know, the same sort of simplistic arguments have been about, you know, East versus West, collective versus individual, et cetera. So I was very curious how you would see that kind of, you know, broader view of the world, institutions, people, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, uh, being folded into thinking about how it sort of manifests in polarization. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I have maybe two things to, to say. Um, one is that um, I, I see it as a kind of yes and sort of situation mm -hmm. where um, I think, you know, each of the kinds of mechanisms that I pointed to, there's there's psychological evidence that, that we engage in, in this sort of behavior that we do differentially trust sources that we do prefer to conform. Um, there's psychological evidence uh, to support this uh, idea of um, uh, background, either ideologies or perhaps even something more basic about how we think about the world, right? I mean, I think sometimes in this literature, it's not totally clear that you can distinguish a case where it's culturally constructed and ideological and people sort of subscribe to a set of beliefs and a case where people actually self-sort based on um, the strength of their disgust reaction. I mean, so you see papers like, like this saying, well, you know, um, conservatives tend to have a stronger disgust reaction or, or tend to have uh, different kinds of reactions uh, to, to fear, to outsiders. And it's sort of, it's hard to know. Um, I think at this stage, uh, other people may, may know more, but it's hard for me to know um, at this stage, uh, whether we should think of that as cultural or uh, innate across individuals. Um, but once again, it's something that even if that weren't there, other aspects of human psychology seem to be sufficient to explain polarization. Right. Um, and so if we focus all of our attention on uh, trying to sort of solve this underlying tribalistic mm. sort of tendency, um, I, I think that we're going to, to miss other things that are probably also mattering. Right. That's one thing. The second thing is that, um, I, I have a, Kayla and I have an, another paper together where um, we push back against some of these ideas that, that the right way of explaining um, political tribalism is via some organizing principle like ideology. 
which isn't exactly the same as what you're describing, but it's closely related. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so um, George Lakoff, for instance, at Berkeley has this idea that there are two basic ideologies, the nurturing mother and the strict father. Um, and everyone falls into one or the other. And so when you disagree about gun control, or you disagree about um, you know, COVID, you aren't disagreeing about those things. You're disagreeing about whether you, you know, the state should be a nurturing mother or a strict father. Um, and we suggest that there are some examples where uh, there appear to be correlations between values or beliefs that aren't really clearly explained by this kind of ideological explanation, unless the ideology becomes so vague that really anything can be associated with either of them. Well, um, I, but I guess, but also, you know, there's a tendency, right, especially in Western epistemology to be very reductive and have like dichotomies, always break things into dichotomies. So it's like, you know, it's either this or that, and there's like nothing sort of interpolating in between. So there's that problem as well mm -hmm. with that position, uh, as well as what you are uh, suggesting is a, it, so there's a deeper problem with those kinds of positions that are uh, very reductionist in some way, right? Reducing everything to two. But what, so what I would say though is, I mean, so what we do in this paper is we, we show that actually you can uh, arrive at similar kinds of correlations between beliefs um, with a kind of trust dynamics. I see. Where there's no organizing principle, it's entirely endogenous. Um, you get epistemic factions where you have a whole bunch of different beliefs, totally unrelated beliefs, but where agents sort of clump. You know, you've got all the ones who believe action, you know, who prefer actions A, A prime, A double prime, A triple prime, even though they're, they're totally unrelated. And then the ones that prefer B and B prime and B double prime and so on, um, without needing to introduce any kind of organizational principle um, or background ideology or anything to sort of, it, it just happens via a process where, you know, um, I agree with you on gun control, so I'm going to trust your views about climate change. And I agree with you about that, so I'm going to trust your views about COVID. And one example that we point to is, um, and this is controversial, but I, I really like the example, is, uh, you know, last March, hydroxychloroquine became the conservative treatment for COVID, and um, uh, remdesivir became the liberal treatment for COVID. Um, at a, a, a point where there was far before there was, there was clear evidence on it. And so you, you sort of, you see this kind of people sorting into beliefs about matters of fact that appear to depend on their background, you know, other background views. But in a way, I, I don't see any meaningful sense in which hydro, hydroxychloroquine is the strict father solution to COVID and remdesivir is the nurturing mother solution to COVID or the collective versus, versus anti-collectivist one. And it seems like this is just something random happened, but they sorted. Um, so we have, um, let me see, um, you can hear me, right? Okay. So we have a question uh, from Sanjeev Kumar on the chat. Uh, do you think polarization per se may not be problematic, but the fact that we have not developed a framework that can rationalize a pursuit for an underlying unity of things? We don't say that our legs are polarized. So um, I think there are two two separate sorts of issues here. One is whether or not polarization is by itself problematic. Um, and I think there are good reasons to think that polarization is not by itself problematic. Um, <clears throat> especially if polarization is in, in some way transient. Right? So I think that there are very good reasons to think that um, one reason why you might have um, mechanisms that slow down learning it, um, and maybe preserve transient polarization is because it can take a long time to get reliable, consistent, representative data about the world. And, you know, a situation where you have, for instance, different cultural groups or even different individuals performing different practices and learning from those practices is one perhaps where you can expect to achieve better overall outcomes over time. Um, and so you might think that, that some of the mechanisms that lead to polarization are actually mechanisms that over the very long run benefit social learning or benefit cultural evolution or something like that. It may even have been, um, uh, you know, in some sense selected for. Um, so I, I don't think polarization by itself is necessarily uh, problematic. The idea though that um, some of these, you know, really quite dichotomous 
situations, like these, these propositions where there's a lot of evidence, um, and yet nonetheless, there seems to be a very long uh, and, and apparently quite damaging disagreement. Um, I, I, I don't want to think, I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't tend to think that, that the right way of thinking about such situations is one where um, uh, there really are just two ways of being in the world and they're equally right or, you know, in, in a way suggested by this um, uh, idea that our legs are, are not polarized. Our legs are chiral. I mean, I guess that's a different you know, <laughs> physics joke. Um, any other questions? Please feel free to type them into the chat. Well, at any rate, I have another question, so I will again take the liberty, uh, Jim, to ask you. So um, I, I wondered um, whether you found that for particular issues, some models were better descriptors. I'm not talking about the solutions because I mean, I think I totally take your point that, you know, it would be just too simplistic to just say that, okay, let's, this is the model and therefore these are all the solutions that can uh, describe how to mitigate the polarization. But I was curious, so for example, if you took um, sort of the polarization on the issue of vaccination, for example, um, versus climate change, Mm -hmm. um, did you did you find in the modeling approach that you know one set of models was like a, a better descriptor of the problem? Because I think that's the point that you're trying to make, that it's very hard to figure out and restrict ourselves to one unique model. But I wondered if there were particular kinds, you know, I'm just trying to see if there are ways to map particular issues to particular kinds of agent models. Mm -hmm. um, and whether you found that, uh, whether there's something there that you found interesting for, you know, for sure. matters that have to do with, you know, personal being, you know, like a medical issue, which has to do with our personhood, a much more immediate salience than climate change, which for many people feels like it's quite distant because they are not accepting that it has touched us in our lives already, right? So I was just curious about like, you know, the proximity and, you know, what are the other kinds of um, um, uh, beliefs, whether the beliefs mm -hmm. can be classified in some way in terms of a um, particular model being a better descriptor? Um, so uh, to an extent, I mean, I, I want to emphasize again that I mean, the models here are, um, are so simple uh, that I'm reluctant to confidently assert that what's going on in any of these models is um, what's going on in any particular real world case. Um, that said, uh, I do think that some of the qualitative features of the models do seem to invoke particular cases particularly well. Um, and so for instance, one of the things that happens in the, the conformity model is that you have a trade-off between how much you care about successful action and how much you care about conformity. Um, now, normally when we present the model, we think about it in terms of the strength of your preference to conform. Um, but another sort of dual way of thinking about it is the uh, weakness of the benefits of performing the successful action. And so there are some sorts of cases where, uh, although there is a matter of fact, and there is a lot of evidence available, nonetheless, as an individual, the decisions you make uh, um, aren't going to have particularly strong effects one way or the other. Um, even, you know, there's polarization in the U.S. regarding uh, evolutionary theory. Um, again, it's a case where there's an enormous amount of evidence available, but there's absolutely nothing that hurt, like, you, there's no way in which you're individually hurt uh, going around and doing things as an individual that, that uh, are incompatible with evolutionary theory, which for most people just means saying, I don't believe in evolutionary theory. Right? That, that doesn't harm you in some way, but you do get the benefits perhaps of conforming within your community. Um, climate change is a bit like that because the consequences of your action tend to be remote in space and time. Right. Um, but other things like um, 
you know, it, it, it's harder to see um, some of the behaviors we've seen around COVID as um, uh, an example of um, that kind of behavior. On the other hand, I, I mean, Kaelin and I actually considered, we didn't do it, but we considered writing a, um, uh, 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 an op-ed describing how COVID like perhaps reflected just a complete failure of classical decision theory, where you, you think that you can, um, you know, that, that people are motivated right. by immediate benefits or harms, right? right? And, and so sort of directly seeing this kind of behavior led to these kinds of outcomes for these kinds of people who are close to me, I see it directly that that would affect your behavior. But that in fact, it seems like other sorts of considerations um, could counterbalance that kind of direct immediate evidence, right? Especially now, right? I mean, maybe last March or April or May, you know, you're not in New York, you're not in uh, um, Paris, you know, um, maybe you, you, you don't trust the, what you're, what you're hearing about. Um, but uh, by now, I think people have much more direct experience and yet many people still are, are act as if they're very skeptical. So um, we have a question uh, from Jenny Wagner. Is the timing of the update of information for each agent a critical issue? Imagine you update information of the agents asynchronously. Would that change the behavior of the entire network? So there are a few different kinds of effects here. Um, one has to do with how often uh, agents perform their action before sharing evidence, right? So you can think about this as how large a sample do you collect before um, stopping and updating your beliefs, right? Because um, when that's large, uh, you know, you're going to go with what you originally think is the better action. You're going to gather a lot of data and then you're going to reconsider. Um, and you can think of that as a kind of asynchronous updating because you aren't updating every time you gather evidence. You're updating only after a certain amount of evidence has been gathered by each agent. Um, and that absolutely changes uh, the um, various things in, in, in the models. It doesn't change the, the qualitative effects that these are the kinds of outcomes and sometimes you get this and sometimes you get that, but it does change things like the rate at which agents learn, um, which outcomes are more likely, things like that. Um, other kinds of asynchronous uh, learning might involve things like only sharing every so often, even though you're updating more often, or um, some agents share and other agents don't. One thing that we look at is a situation where um, only some agents are able to gather information. Uh, and so some agents are updating only on evidence gathered by others. Um, we treat that as a, a situation where say you have some policymakers and you have some scientists and the policymakers are updating on the scientists evidence. Um, and uh, uh, all of those sorts of things can, can have a, uh, an effect, um, but they, uh, I think at the level of description that I've, I've given here, they, they don't matter to any of the results that I've reported. Great. Um, so there's um, one other question from Tyler Lutz, um, who is a former Frankie fellow. Polarization might also be socially advantageous in situations in which truth itself, for instance, uh, the relative success of A versus B changes with time. Do you have a sense of how your models behave in such dynamic circumstances? I have in mind here climate change in particular in which most of us believe that true distribution of climatic phenomena is changing right before our eyes. Um, so <clears throat> uh, I think that the answer, so we, we haven't looked at situations where the actual um, uh, uh, success rates change. I mean, it's an interesting modification to the, the model, um, but one that we haven't looked at. Um, Kevin Zolman, though, in one of his earliest papers on network epistemology, uh, really emphasized the importance of what he called transient diversity of beliefs, but you might think also as transient polarization. Um, you know, and I, I mentioned this in response to, to Priya's comment early on, or no, no, to, to a, a, an earlier question, the idea that under some circumstances, uh, polarization may actually be beneficial. And so Kevin's suggestion there is that um, uh, basically, if 
in, instead of thinking of the um, a situation where the actual outcomes uh, change, if you think about it as a situation where over time you you get access to new or different kinds of evidence, um, having people who continue to hold the thing that seems incompatible with the old evidence um, means that they'll sort of pursue new lines of evidence. And an example that he gives is the uh, discovery of the bacterial origins of um, uh, ulcers. And so it turns out that there's a bacterium called H. pylori that causes ulcers. Um, in the 19, but, you know, by the 1960s, this, the idea of a bacterial cause of ulcers was basically uh, um, ruled out by a series of really a small number of, of um, very influential experiments that claim to have shown that the stomach is um, uh, antibacterial, basically that, that there, there aren't bacterial cultures in the stomach. And so you can't have a bacterial cause of ulcers. Um, and, you know, one of the, the, you know, people stopped pursuing that line of, of research, except in Australia, where they were just disconnected enough from the rest of the research community. They had their own sort of autonomous research program going, and they continue to explore this possibility and eventually identify the kind of bacterium that hadn't been known before. Um, and, uh, you know, were able to establish that, in fact, that is present in stomachs. And in fact, it does cause uh, um, uh, ulcers, you know, and the guy who right. would I was going to say, this is a prior. famous case where the experimenter actually took drank. the in. Yeah, drank yeah, he drank the, the H. pylori. Drank the, yeah. Yeah, drank the H. pylori. And then, then, then took an antibiotic. So he gave himself an ulcer by drinking the H. pylori and then cured it with an antibiotic. And it's not clear what the epistemic value of that is, but it's certainly got <laughs> a lot of publicity. Uh, I think desperation science, right? <laughs> to persuade, yeah. Um, so I, I guess if there are no further questions, um, I would really like to thank um, Jim for an excellent thought-provoking talk. And we really look forward to the discussion tomorrow uh, with uh, Professor Vedral and Kevin Dorse. So at this point, I just want to invite everyone to unmute and um, a clap <laughs> if possible. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Priya. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Yeah, see you, see you all tomorrow again at 3 p.m. Thank, thank you. And actually, uh, before I close, um, I realized I'd wanted to do this at the beginning. Uh, today is the uh, first anniversary of George Floyd's uh, death. So um, I just wanted us to remember that um, in closing. <laughs>